On January 20, 2024, the City of Edmonton and Edmonton Transit opened up the new Nate Blatchford Market LRT station on the Metro line. This opening of the new train station is remarkable as it's a project that finished ahead of time in the phase one of the Metro line extension, and it's a provision of transit access to a new community. Yes, new communities are indeed the best areas in the city for transit development, either full or partial services. Before we move on to the nitty gritty, let's talk about some terms and definitions. Brand new communities, aka greenfield development, are newly developed areas often built from scratch in a designated area of a city. This area is often in a suburb but can also happen across existing vacant lands in the city. Meanwhile, brownfield redevelopment sites are sites from former industrial, business parks, factories, or even airport areas after a period of revitalization and making sure that all the contaminants and health hazards are controlled. Brownfield development helps more with infilling the density of a city, but it's also a pattern of development for the city. Construction of new transit projects are actually pretty easy in new greenfield development and brownfield redevelopment. The first reason for this is because of the higher vacancy of land. Since there are no or very little development at all, and no developers have jumped in the process of constructing the area, the municipality can have a major control of what they want to plan, create concept designs, and build transit plans to connect with other neighborhoods. If the municipality decided to go with major rapid transit network like light rail, metro, or even bus rapid transit, they have more room to determine the scale of the project, coverage, and the number of stops. It's also easier for them to negotiate since there are fewer to no developers, and it is cheaper to acquire land since there are fewer residents with a lot more flexibility to adjust the scale of the future transit project if deemed necessary compared with a completed neighborhood. It is so much harder to put any new major transit infrastructures in them because of the already high occupation rate, which represents more barriers to building anything. You also have to fight more objections from residents too, because nobody wants to live close to a construction site. And you're also ending up with a lower flexibility for your project since you have to follow predetermined road patterns unless you're building separate infrastructures like a subway network. But since it is expensive, this leads to our next problem, which is cost. Upgrading existing roads to accommodate new substantial transit networks, like let's say building a light rail, is also more expensive than starting a construction from the beginning. This is because you probably have to upgrade the road surfaces, reconnecting all the utility lines, and redesigning existing intersections. The disruptions of traffic and potential utility services also bring some more scrutiny against the project, which will ultimately give the project a bad image. Meanwhile, in slowly developed or not yet developed land, building something new won't cost as much, and you face fewer red tapes for aiming towards a high capacity and high quality service serving people. For the next example, let's do a little simulation, shall we? This is my beautiful, state-of-the-art city in city skylines. I want to upgrade this major corridor to have a tram line with great separation. The space is very limited, so I have to build this with very tight space constraint. But you look here and see that there are some small buildings here in this town that can make way for the line, and you guess it right. The other problem with building transit in an existing area is the risk of bulldozing. You can bulldoze buildings after buildings in the game and relocate the affected people somewhere else because they have no say and you're acting like you have total control of the land, but that's not how it works in real life. Unless you're this evil The negotiation process can take months to reach a common ground, which adds cost to the construction. Sometimes the negotiations will fail time after time, slowly killing or delaying the project. There are also ethical issues with bulldozing, and that is the eviction of people out of their homes. We've seen this with highway projects throughout history, and while transit takes much less space than those highways, those risks can still persist. The tight spaces available for transit often result in the project that is not 100% efficient in the long term, or the service is not attractive enough to increase ridership like advertised. For example, it might be a bus rapid transit project but ending up with only spaced out stops and fancy stations, or light rail transit or tram without dedicated right of way and great separation. Of course, having transit is still much better than having no transit at all, but the scale of the service will be impacted, thus also impacting the ridership and willingness for people to use that service. And lastly, building good transit service once a neighborhood is established is a good way to create a long-term habit for residents. 
let's not forget that many of us have to drive to places and for commuting because there are no alternatives to driving. So having a transit service is a great way to create equitable access to transit, meaning those who want it can use it occasionally, while those who need it deserve the service if they moved into the area. And people are reluctant to change, especially when it comes to habit. So having available transit services in the new neighborhoods encourages people to take up new habit and commuting pattern. A person will likely use that new transit service if it's available and attractive to them. So allowing new transit projects at the same time a neighborhood is established and developing is a great way to set up new habits and build the ridership. Instead of trying to convince people to use transit many years later when the neighborhood is fully developed and people have already used to other more comfortable and faster modes of transportation. Building transit first and waiting for the neighborhood to develop before establishing the service is also a great way to encourage developers and the government to speed up the development process as they surely want to make the service happen as soon as possible to collect revenues as quickly as they could. And I'm pretty sure that the residents close to that unopened train station will think Man, I really wish that station will open soon. To end this video, let's take a quick review of the new Nate Flashford Market Station of Edmonton's Mitchell Line. This station is longer to accommodate five car trains. It has two platforms, unlike most LRT stations on the line with single island platforms. The station also features some bike parking racks next to the bikeway, and there are new LRT signs displaying the arrival information of the trains. The crosswalks crossing the track don't have crossing arms, but there are traffic lights with loud audible signals to inform pedestrians that a train is coming. <coughs> the station is also equipped with ticket machines and heated shelters where you can wave your hand at the sensor to open the door. The roof also features solar panels to generate energy for the operation of the station. Metro Line will operate as an urban LRT through the segment of the line, thus the crossing arms were taken away. North of the station, you can find tracks already laid all the way to Blatchford Gate, but the station remains sealed and closed. I can't wait to see new development popping up west of the station just so it can live to its name, Nate. Blatchford Market. This modern station is currently serving the students of Nate mostly, thus only track 2 is in use. I hope to see the full extension of the metro line one day. Thanks all for making this far to this video and I'll see you in the next video. I'd like to thank all my supporters who support me via my buy me a coffee page. If you'd like to see your names at the end of the video, check out the donation links in the bio. I appreciate any amount that you chip in as making these videos require a lot of efforts, research, and also money for articles and books, but you helped maintain my motivation. See you in the next videos.